Some of us on Friday evening were at the uh, talk and the questions from John Blanchard. And uh, those of you who were will remember that he quoted to us from the verse, which he said is the middle verse in the entire Bible. If you count up all the verses of the Bible and you come to the very middle one, this is it. Nothing special about it, particularly because of that, but nevertheless, interesting. Psalm 118 and verse 8. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Well, this very week and this very weekend, what an important word for us to remember. And we're going to sing to begin this morning number 196 in our hymn books, a hymn that reminds us to praise the Lord who above all things reigns mightily, the Lord who keeps us safe at his side and sustains us. Have you not seen that all you have needed has been met by his gracious ordaining? Number 196, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. The Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. And gladly, O Lord our God, we praise and adore you. And with relief and great gladness, we trust in you and not in man. And we take our refuge in you and not in princes, not in leaders or rulers of men or great nations or great unions of nations. And amid the fears and uncertainties that fill this world and therefore which so often fill our hearts, we come to you and we bow in your praise. And gladly we acknowledge that you alone are the king and the ruler of all men and all nations. We look around us, Lord, in these days in our lives and everywhere we are wont to see the hills of foreboding and of fear. But we look up and then we remember that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth the maker of every continent, every nation, every government, every plan. And so, Lord, we trust in your great promises that, as the psalmist says, you will not slumber, but that you are awake always to watch over your people, to watch over your beloved church as, as our keeper, as our helper, as the one who will never, ever fail us, and how we rejoice, Lord, as we remember again that you will keep us, keep us from all evil, that you will keep our lives. You have covenanted to keep our going out and our coming in, not only in this time, not only throughout the days of our earthly lives, but forevermore, forevermore in your presence and in your eternal kingdom. And so, Lord, amid these days of change and of uncertainty, we run to you. We rejoice that you are our God. And we pray that it may please you to give to all your people in our nation this day an increase of grace, that we should hear meekly your word, to receive it with pure affection and to bring forth the fruit of your spirit so that above all your name may be spread abroad and known and hallowed in our own land and above all that Jesus Christ should be glorified in the midst of your church here in these islands that the gospel of Christ might be unfettered might be heard believed in and trusted and obeyed that men and women and boys and girls our countrymen our friends our family our workmates that they might come to know what we know and know the sure anchor of their souls for all eternity in the Lord Jesus Christ the great Savior the great ruler and the judge of all men so hear us, Lord, and draw near to us this day, we ask, to fill our hearts with faith. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, we uh, have a baptism this morning. Little Sater Malu is going to be baptized, and... Uh, I'll uh, ask them in a few moments to come up and join us up here, Dasur and Mariam, uh, his mum and dad. But first, let me uh, say a few words of explanation uh, as to what this is all about. Hear the words of the institution of the Holy Sacrament of Baptism as delivered by our Lord and Savior to his disciples after the resurrection and just before his ascension to the right hand of God. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And go, therefore, 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now the prophets of old had foreseen and foretold a day when through the Christ, the Messiah, God would do a new thing on the earth so that no longer would he be the God chiefly uh, of the Jews but now also for every people and tribe and tongue and nation the world over all people who are cleansed by the grace of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ so Ezekiel spoke from God and said in those days I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you'll be clean and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And the prophet Joel said, likewise from the Lord, in those days I will pour out my spirit upon all my people. And the sacrament of baptism thus instituted is a sign and a seal of God's covenant grace in this new age, the age of gospel fulfillment. Because it speaks of fulfillment once and for all, of all the, the washings, the repetitive sprinklings of the Old Testament times, it speaks of our engrafting into Christ forever through a once and for all forgiveness, through his once and for all sprinkled blood. It speaks of regeneration through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit from this ascended Lord in heaven. And therefore it preaches the joyful message of true adoption and of resurrection to everlasting life. Now, although, of course, little children do not yet understand these things, yet the promise is also to them. Children born into the homes of believing parents, they have, by the providence of God, they have an interest in that covenant from their earliest days. They're heirs to the covenant of grace. They're set apart as holy by God's gracious providence, as Paul says to the church in Corinth. And therefore, they are entitled to the seal of this covenant, which is baptism. In this sacrament of baptism, God is saying once again, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for if such is the kingdom of heaven. And Christian parents bringing their little ones for baptism are simply saying, yes, I believe you, Lord. And I want this to be also for our children. So this covenant act of baptizing a helpless infant is in fact a standing witness to the priority of grace over faith in the Christian life. So in baptizing this little one, we are visibly declaring the true gospel to the world. We're saying that what God does for us, indeed he does without our merit without even our knowledge. Perhaps more plainly in baptism than anywhere else, we see that God commends his love towards us, as Paul says, in that while we were still without strength, Christ died for us. So it is. In the gospel, God's word of grace comes to us freely, without awaiting any response on our behalf. And yet, of course, the gospel word never comes to us without also calling for a response on our part. It calls always for the obedience of true faith. And so this word that we proclaim today in baptism is never something that we can take lightly. It does call for real faith. It calls for real trust in due time from the little one themselves as they grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But also from the beginning, from Christian parents. And God has promised to us great and gracious things as his people and as Christian parents. And we must take him seriously. And we show that by bringing up our little ones in resolute faith, not in fear. Faith that our children belong to the Lord. And as he commands us, we therefore are to bring them up in the discipline, in the instruction, in the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is the duty of those who uh, bring their children for baptism to confess the faith into which they are to be baptized and to promise before Almighty God 
to indeed bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So Dasur and, and Mariam, would you like to come and join us up here? Now Dasur and Mariam, and especially you Dasur, as under God the, the head and the leader of this household of faith. Sartre depends and will depend chiefly on both of you for the help and for the encouragement that he needs. And so I must ask you both, in presenting your child for baptism, do you confess your trust in God as your Heavenly Father and in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier? We do. Do you promise then, depending on God's grace, to teach him the truths and the duties of Christian faith and by prayer and precept and by example to bring him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. All of us who are gathered here today as the household of faith here, we also bear responsibilities under God alongside these parents. We also are called to encourage them and to help them and indeed to pray for them as they bring up their little ones in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as a mark of our responsibility and our solidarity with the parents, I'm going to ask all of us uh, to stand. Okay. So then, Satter, who's fast asleep, as uh, your parents claim for you both the privileges and also the responsibilities that belong to those who bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sater, I baptize you. I'm sorry. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and be with you all the days of your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Well, according to Christ's commandment, Satyr is now received into the fold and the family of this church. He is engaged, if you like, to grow into his faith in Jesus Christ and we trust to be his faithful servant and soldier all the days of his life. And I therefore com uh, commit him and his family into the love and the care and the prayers of our congregation. And in the name of the Lord Jesus himself, I exhort you, all of us, to discharge faithfully our duties to this little one and to his family. So as we stand, let's pray. Lord, and God of the eternal covenant promises to us in Christ. We pray that you would grant us the faith to be true to what we've promised today. And may this precious family and indeed this whole church family, may we seize upon these wonderful tokens of your abundant grace and so appropriate them with gladness and joy that what's done today in marking out this little one is yours may indeed come to full fruition as he grows into Christ from his earliest days. And may it stand for all eternity for the honor and the glory of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And as we stand, we sing together the hymn on the screens, Gracious Savior, Gentle Shepherd, Little ones are dear to thee.
Well, let me welcome you very warmly to our fellowship here this morning, very special if you're visiting with us, and uh, particularly if it's your first time here as uh, part of the Tron Church. Uh, we hope we'll have an opportunity to meet and greet you uh, after the service, whether you're up here, I can see you now, or whether you're uh, downstairs, I trust that you can see and hear uh, and feel very much part uh, of our fellowship this morning. Now, we don't have notice sheets for these uh, weeks during the summer when so many folk are away, but there are one or two things to remind you of. Uh, we have our summer Sunday school beginning today for young children, and uh, uh, they're able to go out during the next hymn, and they'll be looked after downstairs. And if you're visiting and you'd like to uh, take your children to that, then there'll be people outside uh, very willing to show you where to go. We meet again this evening here at uh, 6.30 for our evening service. Paul Brennan uh, will be preaching and we'd love for you to come back and join us then and share fellowship again around the Lord's Word. On Wednesday, pray for Terry. He will be preaching at the lunchtime service. And then on Wednesday evening, we have at 7.30 our church prayer meeting. And again, can I urge you to come and join us? There'll be, uh, as you can see already, people on holiday and uh, people missing. Do come and add your voice to the prayers of the fellowship as we pray at this time, not just for ourselves, but for many all around the world with whom we partner in the gospel at 7.30 on Wednesday. Uh, such an important time. Thursday, uh, our summer evenings for students and young workers uh, in the place of Release the Word begins. They alternate between a social evening and a Bible study evening. And this week, I'm told you're meeting at 7 o'clock at Kelvin Grove Bowling Green for Lawn Bowls. So there you are. That'll be an exciting, uh, exciting event for some of you. Try not to mess up the turf. We don't want complaints. But uh, I'm sure that'll be a happy time. If you want to know more, uh, speak to uh, one of the staff, one of the folks on duty. They'll tell you more uh, about what to do. On Saturday at midday in the University Chapel, we shall be having the wedding of Stella Lee and James Duffus. So I'm sure you'll want to be in prayer for them. And uh, they are keen to say that any who'd like to come and join in the service uh, would be very welcome indeed uh, as they celebrate their marriage. So do remember them. Next Sunday, we meet as usual. It will be a communion service in both our 9 and 11 o'clock services, uh, and we'd love for you to be with us then. If you uh, looked at the bookstall on the way in, you hopefully would have seen a display of uh, this book, which is uh, a book for the summer, A Camaraderie of Confidence. It's the latest uh, little book of short Christian biographies uh, from John Piper, and uh, the subtitle is The Fruit of Unfailing Faith in the Lives of Charles Spurgeon, George Muller, and Hudson Taylor, three great figures of 19th century Christianity who uh, were contemporaries and who knew each other and uh, who had a great influence on each other. And indeed, it's an inspiring book. Uh, we are very different from them. They were unique and extraordinary individuals, each playing a, a great place in uh, God's plan and purpose for their day. But the thing that does unite us with them is that, of course, our God is their God and our faith is their faith. And uh, this is a, a really inspiring read. It's very short. It's ideal for uh, perusing on your holidays. So I warmly commend it to you. And uh, if you're looking for something for summer reading, look no further. But uh, there are plenty of other books on the bookstall too. Lastly, we are congratulating very heartily uh, Kieran and Kaz Dodds in the birth of their little twins. And uh, you're not surprised to see a photograph. There have been 25,367,000 photographs already <laughs> from our photographer friend Kieran, but that is little Ada and Isabel. And uh, all are doing very well and uh, hope to be home within the next few days. So I'm sure you'll want to congratulate them. Kieran was out at the Kelvin Grove service this morning, but I suspect already will be uh, with his little ones uh, in the Southern General. So we're delighted to rejoice with them. Well, let's uh, turn, shall we, to our Bibles now and to God's Word. And we're reading in Ezra chapter 9 and 10. Edward is concluding our study in this book. You'll find it on page 395 if you have one of the church visitors' Bibles. And... Uh, We'll read chapters 9 and most of chapter 10, although you may be almost as glad as I am that I'm not going to read through all the great long list of names right at the very end, important as they are. So Ezra chapter 9 then at verse 1, and you remember last time we were reading about 
All the people of Israel gathered to hear God's word read, to hear the law of Moses, to have it explained to them so that they understood it and took it to heart. And after these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my beard and head and sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, they gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, Oh, my God, I'm ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt and for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the swords, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within this holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying the land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us? so that there should be no remnant, nor any to escape. O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and Casting himself down before the house of God, a, a very great assembly of men and women and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, the son of Elam, addressed Ezra, We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take oath that they would do as had been said. And so they took the oath. Then 
Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Jehohanan, the son of Elishab, where he spent the night, neither eating bread nor drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithlessness of the exiles. And a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem, and that if anyone did not come within three days by order of the officials and the elders, all his property should be forfeited, and he himself banned from the congregation of the exiles. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month on the twentieth day of the month. And all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have broken faith and married foreign women, and so increased the guilt of Israel. Now then, make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, It is so, we must do as you have said. But the people are many, and it's a time of heavy rain. We cannot stand in the open, nor is this the task for one day or for two, for we have greatly transgressed in this matter. Let our officials stand for the whole assembly. Let all in our cities who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times, and with them the elders and the judges of every city, until the fierce wrath of our God over this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jehaziah, the son of Tikva, opposed this, and Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levite, supported them. Then the returned exiles did so. Ezra the priest selected men, heads of fathers' houses, according to their fathers' houses, each of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to examine the matter. And by the first of the first month, they had come to the end of all the men who had married foreign women. Now there were found some of the priests, and a list of their names, and of the Levites, their names and of Israel, all these names. And verse 44 sums up, all these had married foreign women, and some of the women had even born children. Amen. And may God bless to us this his word, help us to understand it, and hear his word to us today. Well, we have a few moments of quiet now as the musicians play and as our offerings for the Lord's work are received. We like to read over and meditate on these words that we'll be studying shortly or perhaps just to be quietly in prayer.
Let's pray together. Oh God, our Father, as we bow before you this morning, having read these words in the book of Ezra, words about a people gathered to confess their sin, to realize the folly of their ways, to recognize their abandonment of the word of truth and of life. So we find ourselves standing before you this morning in these momentous days, not only for our own nation, but for the continent of Europe. And we also must stand before you, Lord, acknowledging that for many decades we have been increasingly turning our back upon the words and the ways of you, our God, the God of truth and of light. As a nation, Lord, we have had the immense privilege of century upon century of the openness of your word, of the understanding of your ways, such that the very foundations of the nation and of our society have been built upon the precepts and the examples of your word and your law, which alone brings righteousness that can exalt a nation, which alone brings the peace and stability that can give the freedoms and so much that we have taken for granted. And yet we stand in these days of momentous change and uncertainty. And therefore, Lord, we pray that you would look upon us with mercy and grant us, we pray, better than we deserve. We think of our parliament and our political parties and all the upheaval that we will experience over the coming days with the resignation of the prime minister and in due course the appointment of a new prime minister and no doubt a rearranged government and cabinet. Perhaps also major changes in the leadership of the main opposition party. We dare to ask, Heavenly Father, that at this sobering time for us as a nation, you would grant us leaders and a new prime minister of caliber, of honesty, of integrity, of great wisdom in knowing how to lead and where to lead our government and our nation through all that is to come. We ask, Lord, that in a nation which has been so greatly divided by the recent referendum, that you would bring, instead of acrimony and bitterness, a spirit of healing and togetherness, of realism and looking to the future, of understanding the need to work together and to bring peace, prosperity, sanity into our political discourse. We think of the many leaders of uh, the European nations, the nations of the European Union, and many of the elites in the service of the European Union, its parliament, its commission, its council of ministers, and all the other paraphernalia that we have become so accustomed to. So many of these have become so distant, so out of touch with the reality of the lives of ordinary people across the continent. And that is why we are in the situation we are in today. We pray, Lord, that such would indeed, by the events of recent days, be truly humbled, that they would have the wisdom to take heed to the mood of discontent and of anger right across Europe to act with sanity, not with vengefulness, to act with probity, not with foolishness, that there might be a working together and a realignment 
of interests that will bring peace and stability to our continent and not allow us to descend into fractiousness and fragmentation. There are so many great trials that are facing the Western world in this day, the movements of millions of people from one place to another, the globalization of the world of business and commerce and trade and financial markets, all of these things which make our world now so interconnected, where there are so many forces for good, for progress, for blessing, for enrichment of the lives of citizens. So much has been done over recent decades to bring trade and prosperity to so many nations, to alleviate poverty, to alleviate illness and sickness. And yet along with all of that, so much has been exploited for greed, for evil ends, for the propagation of violence, of hatred, of dark and destructive ideologies. Protect us, Lord, we pray in this hour as we see that when man unites together to build what he considers to be a world order to rule the universe from, all such thinking can only be great folly if we leave out the God who is the maker of heaven and earth. And from the beginning, the aspirations of those who would build the Tower of Babel must be frustrated. So teach us, Lord, to humble ourselves as human beings, great or small. Teach our leaders to humble themselves and remember that it is God who sets up and it is God who tears down. That your throne is the throne that spans the heavens and that every earthly throne, be it king or president or prime minister or government, every such throne can only exist by your word and by your permission. And so, Lord, above all this morning, we pray as Christian people that you would help us and our brothers and sisters in Christ all over our nation, all through these islands and all over the continent of Europe, <clears throat> that you would help us to see above, to think in terms of the great, the heavenly, the eternal issues, not just the issues of this passing world. Open the curtain to the heavenly realm as we pray, as you opened it to your servant Daniel, that we might see the Son of Man rising to the throne in heaven, from which he rules and from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Teach us, Lord, to number our days that we might have a heart for wisdom to know what your calling is upon our lives at this time. Make your church strong, we pray, confident in the one truth, the one gospel, the one message that can bring true health, true happiness, true prosperity, true salvation forever and ever. That in these coming days, whatever they hold for us politically or economically as a nation or as a continent, you would use them to strengthen the church of Jesus Christ. That men and women and boys and girls might come to hear his word, to know him, to love him, to find their refuge in him. And to know that in knowing him, there is safety to be found. There is prosperity. There is a future. There is hope. So, Lord, our prayer this morning is that of the psalmist. Incline our hearts to your testimonies, we pray, and not to selfish gain. Keep our eyes from looking at worthless things and give us life in your ways. For we ask it in the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, we come then this morning to God's Word, and as we do so, we sing together number 158, God whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. Hear us, we humbly pray. 
And where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. Number 158. Well, let's turn to our passage in the book of Ezra, chapters 9 and 10, on page 395, if you have one of our hardback Bibles. My title for this morning is Ezra Grasps a Nettle. I wonder if I'd be right in guessing that while our passage was read out earlier in the service, you began to feel rather uncomfortable. And perhaps you experienced one of the following two reactions. First, you might have thought, why did this passage have to be included at all in the book of Ezra? After all, chapter 8, which we read last week, was so positive and happy, describing the triumphant return of Ezra to Jerusalem with a large number of Israelites who were courageously making the long journey from Babylon to uh, Jerusalem. They put their best foot forward, they trusted the Lord, they fasted, they prayed for protection, and the Lord brought them safely to the promised land, back to their beloved city, where they lived, as far as we know, happily ever after. So we might think, could not the story have been ended there? Was it necessary to tell the world about this unhappy business of divorcing foreign wives? Well, that's the first possible reaction. Why include this story at all? Now, the second reaction you might have had would be to say, But how dare Ezra tell people whom to marry and whom not to marry? Isn't that a shocking infringement of personal liberty? Isn't it completely out of sympathy, in any case, with the modern world? In the modern world, we have such enlightened and liberal views about marriage. A man may marry whomever he wants to. He can marry a woman. He can even marry a man these days. Perhaps legislation will soon be passed, enabling him to marry his dog or his budgerigar. 
So the idea that anybody should put restrictions on whom a person can marry is intolerable in the modern world. Let's take the first of those two reactions first, the idea that it might have been better not to include the story at all. Well, the Bible, praise God, is a warts and all book. It never whitewashes or airbrushes the character and actions of the people of God. And that is a great relief, surely, to all of us. Jesus is the friend of sinners. That's why he's my friend. The Bible shows us the nature of sin in graphic detail. Paul describes himself as the chief of sinners. Think of the great apostle Peter. His frailties are put on view for the world to see. Even the greatest men of the Old Testament, like Abraham and Moses, have faults and moral compromises written up in plain language. David and Solomon, Israel's two greatest kings, are shown to have deeply flawed characters. And although it's painful to us, it is necessary for us and good for us to be shown how God's people can go badly wrong, because it helps us to see the nature and the possibilities of sin in our own hearts. It acts as a warning to us not to behave in similar ways. So a passage like Ezra 9 and 10 shows us both sin and repentance and progress in godliness. The repentance leads to change, to a greater corporate desire in the people of God to honor him and to live by his standards, which are so different from the standards of the world. So it is good for us to read a passage like this, even though it's not very comfortable to be probed by the message. It's a bit like the unpleasant tasting medicine that a mother sometimes has to give to a young child. You must take your medicine, Toby. I don't want to, Mum. It's nasty. But you must, my boy. It's good for you. It's a bit like that. So let's thank God for including this passage because it teaches us about sin and repentance and change. We're all sinners, and we need regular reminders of the importance of ongoing repentance and ongoing change. Repentance is not just for the beginning of the Christian life. It's a way of life. It has to go on. Now let's turn to the second reaction that we might have felt. That for Ezra to tell these men to divorce their wives was a horrible thing to do. Especially when you remember that through the prophet Malachi, virtually a, a contemporary of Ezra's, God says, I hate divorce. And also when you remember Jesus' attitude, how he, how he upheld the permanence of marriage, how he said, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Well, now, what is the issue here in Ezra 9 and 10? It may not be quite as obvious as it seems. Look with me at chapter 9, verse 3. Ezra, obviously, is writing in the first person. As soon as I heard this, this news, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. What was it that made this godly man Ezra, when he heard about it, react so strongly to tear his clothes and the very hair of his head, a very painful expression of grief and sorrow. Look on to verse 4. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles. Now, that is the issue, faithlessness or infidelity, being unfaithful to God. Look on to chapter 10, verse 2. 10-2 where Shechaniah, who's one of the, the leaders there in Israel, comes and speaks to Ezra. And he says to Ezra, we have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. So the issue is breaking faith or unfaithfulness to God, not being true and loyal to the covenant relationship which is described and detailed in the law of Moses. So let's dig into this a little bit further. The issue was not simply about Jews marrying Gentiles. It was not an issue about racial purity, about keeping Jewish blood undiluted by Gentile blood. Just think back into the Old Testament for a while. Think of Joseph, the great patriarch. He was sent down to Egypt, found himself going to Egypt because of his brother's action. Uh, he discovered many years later that it, it was because of the providence and kindness of God that he'd been sent there to preserve the people of Israel. But when he was there in Egypt as a young man, 
the Pharaoh arranged a marriage for him to a woman called Asenath, whose father was a pagan Egyptian priest. And this Egyptian uh, wife provided Joseph with two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who gave their names to two of the 12 tribes of Israel. Think of Moses. He fled from Egypt into the deserts of Midian, and he married a Midianite woman, Zipporah, who bore him two sons. Think of Rahab, the Canaanite from Jericho. Think of Ruth, the Moabitess, who became the great-grandmother of King David. Both Rahab and Ruth feature in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. There was no fundamental rule in the law of Moses against marrying a Gentile on the grounds of racial purity. In fact, there was even a law in Deuteronomy chapter 21 which said this, that if you had an Israelite soldier who in battle had captured a Gentile woman, he could take her home as a prisoner of war and then he could marry her if he wanted to, as long as she took certain ritual steps to separate herself from her own people because then she would be fully incorporated into the Israelite people and her children would be counted as full Israelites. Think back to the original covenant that the Lord God made with Abraham. It was a promise of great blessing and it came out in three ways. The blessing of a land promised, the promised land, the blessing of the people, the Jewish nation, and the blessing of uh, uh, to, to the Gentiles, salvation blessings to the Gentiles through the Jews. Now, God said that to Abraham in about 1900 BC. Come forward about 1,200 years to the prophet Isaiah in about 700 BC. He wrote this in his 56th chapter. The foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Jesus himself picked that up much later. So the Old Testament repeatedly tells us that God's loving purpose is to include many Gentiles as well as Jews in the role of God's elected and saved people. Now having said that, there are passages in the law of Moses which command the Israelites not to intermarry with the Canaanite tribes. But the reason for that command is not to do with racial purity. It's to do with something else. Let me read you a few verses from Deuteronomy chapter 7, and you'll see what Moses is concerned about. He says this, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering to take possession of it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn your sons from following me to serve other gods. This then is how you must deal with them. You shall break down their altars, dash in pieces their pillars, and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God." The issue then is not racial purity, it's idolatry and false religion. The danger is that young Israelite men and women would intermarry with Canaanites and they would start worshipping their gods and following their religious practices, which included such things as fertility orgies and child sacrifice. And it was those sort of things that the Israelites had been indulging in for centuries. It was because they'd been turning to all this idolatry again and again that God had finally punished them by sending them into exile. And this is what Ezra is talking about in his great prayer that begins at uh, verse 6 in chapter 9. I'll try and give you a a paraphrase of the prayer. What What he's saying is this. Lord, because of our real guilt, you punished us justly and sent us away into exile. And then you blessed us and favored us quite beyond anything we deserved because you brought a remnant of your people back to Jerusalem. You gave us, in the words of verse 8, a secure hold. That's a phrase from pitching tents. It means you put down your tent peg securely once again in your holy place in Jerusalem. And now you've given us a season of reviving or revival. 
You've given us favor in the eyes of the Persian Empire, and you've allowed us to return, to rebuild the temple, to get started again as your people in the promised land. And what are we doing? We're repeating the same dreadful, sinful process. We're forsaking your commandments again, verse 11, which you commanded. Let me just read from verse 11. The commandments which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land that you're entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations, that's their religious practices, that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, for that reason, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, that's the exile, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none of us can stand before you because of this. Do you feel his pain? This is why, to go back to verse 3, he sat appalled and tore his clothes and the very hairs of his head. But the issue is not racial purity. It's what he calls in verse 11, the abominations and uncleanness of the religious practices of these Gentile nations. It's not about purity of race. It's about purity of faith and personal conduct. Now, just what the implications of all this might be for us, we'll come on to a little bit later. But let's drill down further first into what was going on here. And let's notice two things. First, the convicting power of God's law. Just think back to the whole of this book of Ezra. Why was Ezra sent by God to Jerusalem in 458 BC? It was to teach the law of God, the law of Moses. We saw this very clearly. You might just look back to chapter 7, verse 10, which gives us a succinct portrait, a pen portrait of, of who Ezra was and what he'd come to do. 7.10. He'd set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it, so that he could teach his statutes and rules in Israel. The exile had ended about 80 years earlier, back in 539 BC. That's when the Jews began to return to Jerusalem. They had the temple rebuilt and up and running by 515 BC. But it seems in the years that followed that the teaching of God's word and law had fallen into disrepair. So Ezra was sent many years later, 458 BC, to teach the law of God. Now, what is the purpose of teaching the law of God? What effect does the law of God have on those who are taught it? Well, broadly speaking, the law of God does three things. First, it blesses society by restraining sin. It teaches people the difference between right and wrong. So, for example, it teaches us that society will be much happier and more secure if we refrain from murdering each other, from adultery, from stealing, lying, and coveting people's property. So it restrains sin and reduces crime. Second, it brings conviction of sin. In other words, we read it, we hear it taught, and we realize the folly and wickedness in our own hearts. It troubles our conscience. It makes us cry out, Lord, I'm a sinner. And thirdly, the law shows us how to live. It teaches us how to live a happy and productive and godly life. It teaches us how to love God and how to love our neighbors. Now, it's the second of those three purposes of God's law which is at work here in Ezra chapter 9. It's the power of the law to bring conviction of sin. Just look again at chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 9, 1 and 2. Leaders of the Jews approach Ezra. They're described as officials. They might have been priests or Levites. They might have been lay people with administrative responsibilities. 
But whoever they are, they come to Ezra with this bombshell of a message. Now, why do they come and tell him? Why do they not simply say to each other, we'll not mention it to the old man because it might upset him too much? Why do they drop into his lap this message which they know is going to cause him such pain? Well, surely because his teaching, his thorough teaching of the law of Moses has been convicting them of their sin. Their consciences are deeply troubled. They know that something needs to be done about this very wrong situation. Verse 3 makes it clear that Ezra himself knew nothing about what was going on. This thing came at him right out of the blue. It reminds me of a number of things that happened to me years ago when I was a parish minister in England. I can still picture some of these moments when perhaps a senior member of the church would come to me and say, Edward, there is something I'm afraid that I have to tell you about a member of our church. And my heart used to sink into my boots when somebody spoke like that because I knew that I was about to be presented with a nettle that would have to be grasped. Pastoral discipline is essential in a Christian church. In fact, without it, a church cannot be healthy. But grasping nettles can be very painful. Well, Ezra's nettle was a much bigger one than anything I ever had to face. But the reason for it coming to the surface at this point was surely Ezra's own thoroughgoing teaching and preaching of the law. He'd been pressing the law of Moses into the people, perhaps for some months now. And the law was convicting them of their sin and reviving their consciences, which had obviously lain dormant for some time. Verse 4 in chapter, in chapter 9, that gives us a fuller flavor of what happened on that day because it shows us that Ezra was not alone in his godly reaction. Verse 4 says, Then all who trembled, not just Ezra, but all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. How grateful Ezra must have been for their company and their support. We learn more about the scene if we turn on to chapter 10, verse 1. 10, 1. While Ezra was praying and making confession and weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. So there were many there weeping with Ezra, even children. Now, can you picture it? Can you imagine the noise, these men, women, and children sobbing, the, the sobbing voices of hundreds of men and of women and even of little children's voices. And did you notice that revealing phrase at the beginning of verse 4 in chapter 9? Chapter 9, verse 4. All who trembled at the words of the God of Israel. They were the ones who gathered around Ezra and wept with him because they shared his view of the holiness of God. They realized that God was not to be trifled with. It may be that Ezra knew the words of Isaiah. He'd probably read Isaiah many times because Isaiah puts these words into the mouth of God in his 66th chapter. This is the one to whom I look, says God, the one who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Let me ask, friends, do you tremble at the words of God? What a blessing it will be to me and to you if we can learn to tremble at the words of God. We shan't trifle with him then. So there's the first thing. Ezra preaches the law of God and it brings conviction of sin. And it's that that leads to confession and repentance and revival. Now secondly, let's notice the godly process by which repentance is facilitated. These two chapters put the spotlight mainly on Ezra, but they also show us how the whole community responded to the crisis. Let's follow the story through and see, <coughs> excuse me, see how it unfolds. First, Ezra sets the direction for the right response. In these uh, first two verses of chapter 9, the leaders come to him and they tell him what's going on. Now, if he'd been a different kind of leader, he might have said to them, well, now tell me how many Israelite men are involved in this practice of marrying Canaanite women? 
And they would have replied, about a hundred. I don't guess that you counted the names at the end of uh, chapter 10, but if you do count them, there are about a hundred involved. Now, the whole community in Jerusalem at this time would have numbered 50 or 60,000 people. If Ezra had been a less godly leader, he might have said to these men, only a hundred? It's quite a small number, isn't it? Not much more than a drop in a bucket. I think, brothers, we should take the rough with the smooth. Let's keep this information to ourselves. Least said, soonest mended. We don't need to open a can of worms at this early stage of rebuilding the community, do we? But that was not Ezra's response. He could instantly see that here was a corrupting influence seeping into the Lord's community, and he knew that it had to be stopped. Godly leadership is like that. When a problem emerges, it has to be addressed fully and quickly. If it's not addressed, the community or the congregation will lose its fear of God and will begin to think that anything goes, that any kind of behavior is acceptable. Years ago, I remember being at a conference for Church of England senior pastors, vicars, and I was one of a group of of ministers who were having a discussion together about what to do if our assistant minister, I think we all had assistants, what to do if our assistant minister stepped out of line in some serious way and began to misbehave. Now, I was only 30-something, but there was a much older man in this group who was responsible for a large parish in a big town, and he said this, what my assistant minister does in his own time is entirely his business and not mine. As long as he works properly during his working hours, I take no interest in his life outside. He can behave as he wishes. Now, this man made no pretense of being an evangelical, as I'm sure you'll understand. But even so, I was shocked by such a cavalier and irresponsible attitude. Ezra is the complete opposite of that. The way his fellow Jews behave is a matter of the deepest concern to him because God's honor is at stake. And God's honor is upheld when the law of Moses is taught and followed. So Ezra, as the leader of the community, sets the direction for how the community should respond. When the other people see how seriously he addresses the problem and how deeply moved and distressed he is, they know that they must follow his example because they know that he is a man who knows the Lord. Secondly, Many other leaders work with Ezra alongside him to grasp the nettle. Look at the speech in chapter 10, verses 2 to 4, that Shechaniah makes to Ezra. Chapter 10, verses 2 to 4. If I'd been Ezra, I would have been enormously encouraged to hear what Shechaniah says. Verse 2, he says, We've broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land, but even now... There is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Now, that verse 4, I think, is a terrific verse. It's a real shot shot of adrenaline for Ezra. Arise, says Shechaniah, because it's your task. You're our leader, Ezra, therefore you must do what needs to be done. But he goes straight on to say, we are with you. We will work with you. We'll shoulder this responsibility with you. We won't leave you to do all the difficult stuff by yourself. We're with you. You can be strong, therefore, and face this task. Now, it's a great model for how leadership works in the Lord's people. There's a senior leader with whom the buck stops. But he is supported by co-leaders who wholeheartedly share his commitment to the Lord's teaching and are prepared to roll up their sleeves and work hard with him so as to solve the presenting problem. Jesus had 12 apostles who worked with him and he appointed many other missionaries. Think of Paul, that great missionary leader. He was at the center of a very large network of like-minded missionaries scattered all over the Mediterranean. They believed the same message and they taught the same gospel. A local congregation like ours needs a senior leader who is surrounded and supported by others who share and understand the same gospel 
and who are willing to support him and work closely with him. Now, in Ezra's case, this close support was exactly what he needed, and it enabled him to address the problem in a thoroughgoing, steady manner until everything was fully sorted out a number of months later. And then thirdly, a plan is made and is then carefully followed through. Chapter 10, verse 5. Then Ezra arose. That's a great verb. In other words, he stood up, he immediately addressed the crisis, and he made all the leaders take an oath to do as Shechaniah had said, that is, verse 3, to make a covenant with God to divorce the Canaanites' wives. Then in verse 6, Ezra spent a night in prayer and mourning. And in verse 7, a proclamation is then made throughout the whole country that everybody, everybody, all the returned exiles, not just those who've married the foreign women, that 100 or so, but everybody should come to Jerusalem within three days so that the whole matter should be faced by the whole community. Everybody needed to know what had gone wrong and what steps of repentance were to be taken. So it wasn't dealt with behind closed doors, with only the transgressors being summoned to Jerusalem. No, the whole community needed to be involved so that everybody together should learn the fundamental importance of obeying the law of the Lord. So the assembly gathers in verse 9 within the three appointed days, and you'll see that at one level it's a scene of wretchedness and misery. As verse 9 tells us, the huge crowd is sitting in the open square, trembling because of the problem that's being addressed, but also because it's pouring with rain. It was late in the ninth month, it was winter, everybody's sitting there bedraggled and soaking and shivering. But at another level, it's a wonderful scene, because Ezra is leading the people back to the Lord. In verse 10, he tells them very bluntly about their sin, and then he says, confess your sin and make the necessary divorces. And they all answer in a loud voice, we will. But Ezra, cut us an inch of slack. It's pouring with rain here. We're feeling awful. We can't sort this out in five minutes, but let due process run its course. We'll work out a timetable and the offenders can come city by city and we'll sort the matter out until, look at verse 15, until the fierce wrath of our God over this matter is turned away from us. Ezra was teaching the people to understand the wrath of God, as any responsible Christian leader will also do today. And so it all happened. Ezra selected responsible senior men to oversee the divorce procedures. The work began some 10 days later, and within three months it was completed. It was a very painful nettle, but it had to be grasped. And an example had to be made of these men who had acted wrongly. And that's why their names are all listed at the end. They are being named and shamed. So it's a story about the convicting power of God's law. It's a story about godly leadership, which brings about constructive corporate repentance. Well, friends, let me finish with a question and two encouragements. First, the question. Do these chapters teach us that a Christian who is married to a non-Christian should divorce the non-Christian? Well, the answer is a very definite no. Think of the teaching of both Peter and Paul in their New Testament letters. They both address the situation of believers married to unbelievers because that was an increasingly common thing in New Testament times as the gospel spread into the Gentile world. And both Peter and Paul taught, married Christians, stick with your unbelieving spouse and seek to win him or her to Christ by your godly and loving behavior. If you want to follow that study up, you'll find uh, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7 and Peter's in 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, that's the Bible's teaching about an already existing marriage, a marriage between two non-Christians, where one spouse becomes a Christian, but the other doesn't. However, getting married, taking the step of getting married to a non-Christian, if you're already a Christian, that is a completely different matter. Don't do that, or your Christian life will fall apart. 
If you're a Christian and you then wrap your life around a non-Christian, you cannot hope to survive as an active believer. Many people have tried to do that, but it's an act of disloyalty to the Lord and it ends in tears. The men that Ezra was having to discipline had deliberately transgressed the law of Moses by taking into their lives women who worshipped other gods. And Ezra had to take this severe disciplinary action so as to teach the people that the law of God must be honoured and obeyed. It was more important to reject idolatry than to avoid divorce. In this case, it was a question of choosing the lesser of two evils. Now, encouragement number one. Let's learn from Ezra's example to hate sin, to grieve and weep and mourn over it. Blessed are those who mourn, says Jesus, not least those who mourn over sin. Do you remember how Jesus wept over Jerusalem? Because of its sinful rejection of the Son of God. And Ezra here is mourning over Jerusalem because of its sinful rejection of the law of God. So let's ask the Lord to help us to mourn and to grieve over our sinfulness. Let's ask him to help us to hate, to hate what he hates, so that we can learn to love what he loves, namely loyalty to him and loyalty to the Bible. Then encouragement number two. Let's learn also to love and be grateful for godly pastoral discipline. If Ezra had not grasped this painful nettle, the corruption of idolatry would have been allowed to creep further and further into the life of God's people. Let's make sure that our church is a family where godly discipline is loved and practiced. It's good for us. It's for our safety and our security to know that if we step out of line, if we step away from Bible ethics, we shall be called to account by our church leaders and by our fellow Christians. It's what all of us need to know. Part of belonging to the fellowship means that we brace each other to live godly lives. It's not as if we're playing big brother to each other, not at all. It's because we love each other. And if we love each other, we care about each other's behavior. I need to know that if I start to behave immorally in some way, there will be a knock on my door, a knock made by a human hand. Well, in the big picture of the Bible, why do we have Ezra chapters 9 and 10? This pastoral discipline, although it was painful and difficult, it was done to promote the holiness, the godliness of the people of God. So here is Ezra, who's really a kind of latter-day Moses, taking care of the people of God. Look back to chapter 9, verse 2. These Israelites are described there by Ezra as the holy race or the holy seed, the elect seed from whom the Messiah, the Savior of the world, was to come four and a half centuries later. This little remnant of the holy race had to be preserved and kept and to have its holiness developed. They were so few in number, and they'd been so humbled and trodden down. They'd been humbled by the Assyrians, then by the Babylonians, then by the Persians. They were then part of the Persian Empire. They were soon to be downtrodden again by the Greeks and finally by the Romans. But from this dejected and impoverished, impoverished little nation was soon to arise the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Ezra, in caring for Jerusalem and its people, points us forward to the new Jerusalem where God's people, cleansed from every stain of corruption by the blood of Christ, will live in God's full and glorious presence. So friends, let's care for each other in the way that Ezra cared for his contemporaries, because through mutual care and pastoral discipline, we are preparing each other to stand in glory around the throne of God and to see our Savior who was born from this remnant of Israel. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Dear God, our Father, have mercy, we pray upon all of us, and incline our hearts ever more deeply as we read the Bible to love the things that you love and to hate the things that you hate. Help us to live godly lives and so to love each other that we're able to keep each other up to the mark, 
to look after each other, where necessary, to discipline each other. And we pray that it will all be to the glory of the name and gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's clear our throats for a final sing. Number 862, a lovely hymn of Charles Wesley. 862, O Lord, who came from realms above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love upon the altar of my heart. 862. <clears throat> Let's close with some words of Paul. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. May this be so, dear Father, in our lives, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>